Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome to the New Books Network. I am Paula de la Cruz Fernandez, your host for this episode. Today we interview Professor Peter Capelli. Peter Capelli is the George W. Taylor Professor of Management at the Wharton School of Business and Director of the Wharton, of Wharton's Center for Human Resources. He teaches awesome sounding courses like how to be the boss and managing and motivating. Some of his areas of research are human uh, resource practices, public policy related to employment, talent and performance management. He publishes in journals like the Academic of the Academy, the Academy of Management Journal and Harvard Business Review and op-eds in in magazines and journals like The New Yorker or The Atlantic Magazine. And today uh, we're looking into his latest book, The Future of the Office, Work from Home, Remote Work, and the Hard Choices We All Face, published by the University of Pennsylvania Press in uh, 2021. Welcome, Professor Peter Capelli. Thank you. I'd like to start the interview with a bit, uh, with knowing a little bit more about your personal, uh, as much as you want, and uh, your professional background, and what has been your career up to this, to your position at Wharton, at the Wharton School. I know you also have been and are appointed as an economic advisor to multiple organizations, and it would be also great to know more about that. Well, uh, I think. Um my career is a little, maybe a little hard to uh, explain. I think the advice for other people is don't do what I did, um, which is to, to move around a little too much. So my uh, PhD was in labor economics from Oxford, which is kind of a quirky place to get um, a doctorate program because it wasn't particularly standardized. I went from there to MIT and to the Sloan School of Management there and studied and wrote about unions. It was right at the point where U.S. unions were kind of collapsing. Um, So I wrote about that stuff um, for about nine years or so. But I was really interested in questions of policy uh, as it affects the workforce and, frankly, as how the workforce affects the rest of the economy and and policy. So um, for about 10 years, a colleague and I here ran a research center for the U.S. Department of Education, um, issues of human capital and the economy and things. And I got interested in these management questions, frankly, because on the practice side, if you think about um, the issues that really matter to people in society and the economy, they're questions like who gets hired and for what? Do people get promoted? Do they get trained? Are there opportunities to advance? You know, all those kinds of questions. So the practice of management, it turns out to have real policy implications. So I got interested in the practice of management. I can't say I was interested in it for theoretical reasons, just because it was really important. So I've been writing about questions like that for uh, quite a while. And the issue of the future of the office obviously was not something that we picked you know, we were, we kind of had this now two year experiment thrust upon us. And so it's a really profound change, biggest change probably any of us have experienced in our lifetime. And, uh, you know, it's important to think about it. So this book was really sort of just trying to think through what does this mean? And what do we already know the answers to some of these questions might be? Because some of these things we've looked at for a while, right, in slightly different contexts. So that's the background. Excellent. Well, you kind of um, answered one of my next question, which was what inspired you to write this book? And perhaps you can expand a little bit more on that um, in in terms of um, did, did lots of people ask you about it or did you just see it as an opportunity to write, to put it in paper and then continue the research? Well, I, I think you're right. That's pretty much exactly what happened is I started out um, basically having to answer a lot of questions about this. And we had um, a lot of issues coming to us from the press, but also from employers who 
you know, we have ties with, you know, what's happening, what should we do here? What does this mean? That sort of stuff. And uh, so I, I wrote a series of pieces in the Wall Street Journal, looking at little slices of these questions. And uh, then I thought, well, you know, maybe we ought to take a slightly bigger look at it. And there's uh, a fair amount of research already been done that was relevant to this question. We've been studying telecommuting, as it used to be known, uh, for maybe almost 50 years now. So telecommuting started in Los Angeles with uh, the idea that uh, smog, as it was known then, in the Los Angeles basin was so bad that they had to cut back on commuting to try to cut down car pollution fumes. So people were working remotely and it was telecommuting because all you had were phones. And so uh, phones is uh, what we did. And so we've been looking at this. And then after the dot-com period, there was actually a time a lot of companies were trying to get people to work remotely because it was uh, real estate costs were, were pretty high, right? And so we've been looking at what happens to people who work remotely. And here's, here's the first big punchline from this book. And that is that um, when you give people a choice as to where they want to work, it is quite a different experience than when everybody is sent home uh, at the same time. You didn't have a choice over the last two years. If your offices were closed, you had to work remotely, right? That's one scenario. Afterwards, if you say, okay, who wants to work remote? That's a very different scenario. And what we know from research is about the second one, and that's what we're staring down here in the future of the office is, what happens if we decide to work from home? And the results, at least for the employees, are on the career side, are all bad, frankly. You know, it may be great for you to work from home on your personal life, but career-wise, everything looks worse. And that may sound hyperbolic, but here's the thought experiment. Imagine you have an identical twin, and the two of you both work for the same company, and you're in the same job. Um, but your twin decides that they want to be permanently remote. They're going to work from home. You're going to be in the office every day, hanging out with the bosses and the peers, and you'll know what's going on all the time. Which of you do you think is going to get ahead faster? Right? I mean, it's not so surprising, right? So outcomes are worse in terms of things like promotion opportunities, pay, uh, but also commitment is lower. It's just hard to feel the ties to an organization if you never see anybody uh, there. The ties to an organization are really ties to people. And uh, if that's if you lose those, then you know you got a real problem, right? So um, that's a first big conclusion. Maybe we could talk more about that a little later. That is a good point. I, I was also just at the end of the of the book also thinking about the comparison with public offices, right? Um, what is the difference there? Uh, because, I mean, lots of um, public offices, federal offices are still closed even. Uh, and who knows um, when they will open. <laughs> Anyways, um, so... So this is a moment when work categories and workspaces are being redefined. Um, but there's a spectrum, uh, and you uh, describe this in your book. Can you go through some of these changes and the new categories of work and also work agreements that have emerged um, and that are becoming quite common now? Yeah, so I think the biggest distinction, and maybe we could go beyond this if you'd like, the biggest distinction is between what uh, we might think of as permanent remote work. This is what's got all the attention, right? This is the idea that you never have to come into the office again, or more or less, you know, you, there's no requirements for you to be in the office, right? And as a result, you don't have to live near your office if you don't want to. You could pick up and go someplace else. That's the dream a lot of people seem to have. You can keep your New York City salary and move to Santa Fe, New Mexico, or the Tetons or something, or, you know, and wouldn't that be lovely? Uh, that's one type. It's a pretty small slice of what we're talking about. And then there is what we are calling hybrid models. And hybrid models basically just means not that, not permanently remote, and not regularly in the office either. So it's everything in between. And uh, that's a harder one to get your hands around because... Um, 
the devil's in the details there, right? I mean, the opportunity to work from home, lots of people kind of already had that. I think in public opinion polling, you see things like 10% of employees report that they had uh, some ability to work from home. Now, some of that's a little quirky, the data, because if you think about it, depending how you count it, most of us work from home. We take work home in the evening. Depending how you count it, you know, that's working from home, right? But more people have had an opportunity, you know, to go home early on Friday, let's say, and uh, take some meetings um, on the road and then just go home rather than come into the office. You know, that, that counts as hybrid too, right? So, but it's not what most people are thinking of. Um, what most people are thinking when they're talking about hybrid is on a regular basis, I can do what I would have done in the office at home. Uh, and there the big question is, how does this help employers? In the public discussion, it's virtually all about what employees want. Right? And, and the problem with that is there's no reason to think you're going to get it just because you want it, right? Employees want all kinds of things and never get them. You know, we all want higher pay. We'd like nicer offices. We'd like bosses who are not so difficult. You know, we'd like all kinds of things. We don't get them. Um, and the only reason we're going to get these things is if we think uh, it somehow helps the employer because they get to call the shots, right? Uh, and it's not clear on the hybrid front how this is going to help employers. Permanent remote, we know what that story is. They're going to take your office away and uh, cut the parking requirements and take reduce the cafeteria expenses and the gym memberships and all the perks and things associated with being in an office. They're going to take all those back and save a fair amount of money. That's the way they're thinking about permanent remote. And the companies that are in favor of that and allowing people to do it, that's what they're going to do, right? Hybrid, mm -hmm. not so clear. Right. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about these negotiations and how they happened at the beginning of the pandemic when, you know, we we were at home. Uh, we thought we were going to go back to work after a month, but we didn't. Could you say a bit more in terms of agency and power between, you know, how how did these negotiations between employees and employers um, worked? Because um, there's also safety issues in place. Like, I don't want to go to, work, to the office. Yeah. I don't want to get infected. Um, and I think those uh, justifications still are part of the negotiation, right? Especially now with Omicron. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I don't think that there was... Um, uh, the power imbalance is enormous, right? Employees as individuals have almost no power negotiating with individual employers, right? Um, and this is, you know, not profound. We've understood this for at least 150 years or so, right? So I think what was, what was going on, if we think back to the U.S. story, people started working from home because the government made them. They told the employers, you have to shut down, right? Uh, and then uh, rather than shut down completely, the employer sends uh, involved in working from home initially. Um, employers didn't choose to do this. The governments, state and local governments made them close down as part of the pandemic uh, effort to deal with it. And the idea of working from home was kind of uh, a last minute adjustment. It looked like it was going to go on long enough that um, it wasn't just going to be for a week. It was going to be maybe for a couple of weeks initially, we thought. And so people in white collar jobs were trying to get things done from home and then went on a little longer. And so more employees, companies tried to get them online so they could do their work from home. And at its peak, uh, the Pew Foundation survey found that um, of the employees for whom it seemed to be possible to work from home, 70% were doing it by the late spring of 2020. Uh, the question is what, what happens after that when it started to become more possible to bring employees back. Well, the first thing that happened is that if you were going to bring your employees back, you had to meet various kinds of state and local regulations about social distancing, for example, right? So that meant your offices had to be retrofitted in a pretty expensive way. 
Uh, if you think that you had cubicles before, for example, well, now everybody has to be six feet apart. You had to put in these fancy humi- uh, air conditioning system, HVAC systems uh, that filtered the air, and it would be pretty expensive to do. So not surprisingly, a lot of companies didn't do it. And smartly, I think, because they were being told that pretty soon we'll all be back in the office. I, I don't know if you remember that we thought for a while everybody was saying it was going to be Labor Day. Uh, but they thought Labor Day 2020, <laughs> and then 2021 Labor Day, and we're still not really back in the office, right? Um, so the problem then in terms of negotiations came that uh, some companies, some regulations started to be lifted. In a lot of places, they have been lifted. Um, and the question for employers is, what, what do you do? Do you bring everybody back, make them come back or not? Uh, And they have some legal challenges in trying to bring everybody back. And one of them is the Occupational Safety and Health Act, which requires that you keep everybody safe. And uh, could you be in trouble as an employer if you bring everybody back and they come down with COVID cases and they claim that they caught it in your office? Could you be in trouble? Yes, you could. Uh, So I think a lot of companies decided, you know, uh, it's just not worth it. Let's just keep everybody home from longer. Um, And so you didn't really have a case of a lot of employees saying, you're trying to make me come back to the office and I don't feel safe, right? So it didn't happen all that much. Um, What is happening since, of course, after the vaccine started to roll out, is that a lot of employers, I'd say virtually all employers, were encouraging their employees to get vaccinated, uh, to be safer, and frankly, because then it would be easier to bring them back without so many restrictions. And that's been an interesting story to watch, right? And, uh, you know, there's just, uh, because vaccination became under the Trump administration and the president himself, right? Such a political issue, at least initially. Uh, and there was so much disinformation about about it. And so many people held these views uh, that it became effectively a kind of political problem for the uh, employers to try to make people do it. So they have been trying since then to get the numbers up with some incentives Um, you know, we'll give you a bonus. We'll give you time off to go get vaccinated. You really should do it. And if you're not vaccinated, uh, you have to be masked all the time and tested, et cetera, uh, to try to get the numbers up. I think at the moment we are facing a situation where um, a lot of employers are are now starting to mandate it, require it, um, and particularly meaning that you're going to lose your job if you don't get vaccinated. vaccinated. For a while, it appeared that the uh, Biden administration's executive order was going to make this easier to do because it was requiring if you had more than 100 employees, you either had to have everybody uh, vaccinated or do pretty extensive testing, which was going to be expensive for the employers. What has changed now is that uh, with the Omicron uh, variety, Testing is not particularly effective because you could be negative um, this morning and positive in the afternoon. The virus becomes infectious so quickly. So now we have a a problem, at least in my view. I think the employers can't really say they're keeping everybody safe simply by testing people. And now they've really got a problem, I think. And... In my view, I think they do have to push people to either be vaccinated, and if you don't want them working from home, then this is that's a requirement of the job, and you can't work here, right? So I I think that's where we are increasingly headed. That's my sense. Right. Um, There is. uh, I'm quoting you. uh, Women were hit harder this time, uh, and you're referring to the earlier period of the of the pandemic, and in. In connection to this, I want to talk about figure 1.1, which is um, where we learn how remote workers organize their time while working from home. And of course, this uh, resonated with my experience. I've been working from home since um, that March 
17th. Um, I, but the, the table says, but indoor leisure is second in the rank above home improvement and childcare. Can you expand on this idea? Because for me, I was, I assure you, it was, I mean, it was working and parenting and yeah. both right. at the same time, many yeah, times. Right. <laughs> well, I think that makes a, a great point. And, and that is when we talk about the experience uh, of remote work, it is so varied, right? Depending on your circumstances. And even before that, what is it that people want? You know, we sort of assume everybody wants to work remotely, um, but they don't. Uh, there's a pretty big chunk of people who want to come back to the office. In fact, I saw a survey result today from the UK uh, that a majority of professional, quote, employees uh, were threatening to or said that they would quit their current job if they didn't have Basically, if they couldn't go back to the office, and the punchline really was it was about the lack of face-to-face um, connections, right? So we're kind of all over the place on on how people respond to do this. I think, you know, for people with kids, uh, work from home meant that you, as you say, you were working all the time. On the other hand, if we didn't have work from home, you would be unemployed. Uh, and that's worse, presumably, right? Because otherwise, you could have. We could have always done it. You could have. We could have quit, I suppose, rather than work from home. Uh, but there's some people working from home is not particularly attractive. If you are, let's say, a new hire, let's say you're just out of college, uh, the idea. You got a great job in New York, uh, and before you start working there, you've moved to New York City. They tell you, great news, uh, you don't have to come to the office, you can stay in your apartment and work. Well, that's normal, right? You want to go to the office because it's cooler there and people are there and you're meeting people and things. And uh, so the experience is quite different, right? Uh, I think what we know about uh, people working remotely, uh, here's the big thing. We haven't thought that much about why they preferred it, right? Right. We seem to assume that the reason people prefer it is because they don't have to commute. But but not everybody has a long commute. Um, some people like me actually were walking to work. It wasn't it wasn't a big problem, right? Um, so for some people, um, maybe it is the commute. Although it in, it turns out, as I note in this my book, that Department of Transportation data shows people who are working remotely were driving less, but not as much as you might think. They weren't commuting, but they were driving during the week more. They're running more errands while they're home, right? Um, And what we know, I think, if we ask people, why do they like remote work? I think the thing that is underplayed is the fact that they had control over their time. That you could start work at seven and start working on stuff, and then you could take the dog for a walk, stop for a while, go around the neighborhood with the dog. You could come back, work for a while, take a break, go get tea, do something in your kitchen. Um, You could run an errand. Your kids come home at the end of the day. You could take an hour and settle them in. Then you could go back to work. So what we saw is self-reported data on hours of work are up. But how much of that is actually kind of fuzzy? It's a good question. Uh, uh, I'm, when I talk about work, I'm talking about the paid employment work. You know, how much of it is, um, am I counting the time I took breaks and that sort of stuff? We do know that it extended into the evening much more than ever before. So companies that were looking at electronic records of what their employees were doing, you know, there was a second shift uh, quite definitely after the dinner hour hours of people going back and finishing work then. But I think what people like is is that they they liked the ability to control their time and take breaks when they needed to or wanted to, and the fact that they didn't have bosses breathing, in some cases, down their neck the whole time. They had more control over what they did and when. That we could duplicate, right? You could do that in the office. The thing I see as the worst outcome is a lot of employers who are thinking about continuing remote work or work from home, are also investing in tattleware. And tattleware is basically monitoring to make sure that you're in front of your computer during the entire day. Well, that's the whole reason for being home is to not have to do that, right? So 
Um, that's a good question we need to think more about is what is it that people actually want to do when they're working remotely or even in a kind of hybrid model? And can we accommodate that? Perfect. Um, another interesting figure is the one that talks about technology and how much um, remote work, um, how much or uh, yeah, how much do, do you think uh, the issue of technology and all the problems that came up with connecting people remotely um, had repercussions on productivity then and, and now? Do you think people work the same way or you know, in the same productive way now than in the office? Uh, well, that's another, of course, terrific question. And, you know, the, the limitation which we're forced to admit is that we really don't know that much about how productive people were in the office. Um, so are we better or worse? It's, it's, it's uh, pretty hard to, to say. Uh, the folks that have looked at this kind of carefully with workers who are individual contributors, so you know kind of what they've done. Um, th the conclusion seems to be that productive pr output stayed about the same. Uh, in other words, it didn't fall. But hours of work self-reported went up, so that suggests productivity fell, right? If you're doing the same amount in a longer period of time, it fell. But are we really sure how we're counting all that uh, time spent kind of at work. These are all white collar workers we're talking about. So it's not that um, they were, you know, scamming the company by reporting more hours. They didn't get paid anymore for it. They're on salary, salaried workers, right? So um, so I don't think on the individual contributor side, we've got a lot of evidence that it's been better. Uh, I think on the collaborator side, when you're working in teams and things, it's just really hard uh, to know. Uh, I, I think what we what we do know is that uh, people don't feel that virtual is as good as face-to-face. -face. And there are lots of little quirky reasons for that. Here, here's one, for example, that if you think about your typical meeting, right, a lot of the interesting stuff about a meeting is talking to the people before the meeting begins. And then after the meeting is over, uh, talking to them on the way out about what happened in the meeting, right? Um, and the problem is if you are the virtual person, you miss all that, right? Uh, but again, the the important issue for us is not so much to compare this all in the office to all at home. It is to think about hybrid where or even remote where some people are in the office and some people are at home. And I think the experience there is pretty clear that if you are the person calling in, uh, even if it's video, you tend to get ignored if the other people are there in the room. Um, and I don't think that's particularly surprising, right? Uh, I was intrigued uh, also by by the analogy you make in another page, you say hiring a new employee to be a full-time remote worker, um, and you already talked about that, uh, how difficult it is to become, I mean, the onboarding um, phase uh, being remote, um, the extreme case, right? And then it's similar to engaging with a consultant or independent contractor. Can you explain that analogy, please? Well, if you think about a permanent remote worker, right? So this is somebody who's not going to be in the office. Um, if you have meetings and they're on the team, they're going to be, you know, zooming in on the meeting or maybe calling in on the meeting. Um, you, you never see them. Um, uh, does that feel any different than having a contractor? Uh, doesn't really, I don't think. Maybe, maybe a little bit. But I think the big issue is, let's say you're the chief financial officer of the company and you're asking this question, please tell me why we're paying uh, employee-related expenses, payroll taxes and that sort of stuff for this person and uh, for contractor, we don't. So why is this person still an employee and not a contractor? And I think that's the question we have to answer. Uh, and the answer is not going to be so obvious, right? If somebody is really permanent remote, 
you know, remote. Uh, and we don't feel that um, we have quite the same ability to lean on them as we do, let's say, people who are in the office. You know, uh, the last minute project comes up. You look to the first person who's in the office to help you. Um, maybe, maybe you get on Zoom or you try to email the people who are remote, but they don't respond uh, because, you know, they're part of the reason for being remote is because they're not glued to their computer all day, you know? So, uh, so you pass them over and you go to the person next to you. So, you know, it's, it starts to feel more like a contractor. Now you could try to change that and you can see why some employers might want to and say, if you're going to be a remote worker, you've got to be available to us during the following work hours. And you could do that uh, so that they have to be kind of always on. Uh, we had a colleague at Wharton who used to do that when he was working remotely. He had a computer screen on his desk with a camera on him working from home. So if you walked in, his head was right there above his desk and he did that all the time. You could do that. <laughs> You could do that, but the problem for the remote worker is you want to do that. I mean, isn't the whole point of being remote so you have control of your time, right? So, so I think that's a big concern. If you are a person given the choice about, do I want to be a remote worker? You have to ask yourself, what's going to happen to me if I am a permanent remote worker in particular? Um, I think it's a pretty risky task. Um, and I think one of the things to ask yourself too, before you go too far down the path on this and say, yeah, I want to be a permanent remote worker. My Silicon Valley company told me I could work anywhere. So uh, it doesn't matter. So we're selling our house, we're moving to Wyoming, and um, I'm going to be working from there. That'll be great. Well, what's the average tenure of a Silicon Valley tech worker? It's a couple of years. So you get out there and um, two years later, boom, your job's gone. Well, if you're in Silicon Valley, pretty easy to find another job. Um, you're betting, I guess, that if you're in Wyoming, somebody else will offer you the opportunity to work remotely. But that's a pretty big bet, right? Uh, so it's a big risk I think you're taking, especially with the permanent remote approach. So another thing that you point out that will change is the evaluation process. The um, how 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 will this be in the future when you know when you get if you are salaried and you but you are remote how 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 do evaluations work? Yeah. Well, it's a good question as to how they work now, right? So I've written about this in other contexts, but it's 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 terrible the way we manage people's performance and the reason. It's terrible as we don't take it very seriously uh, and supervisors don't want to do it. So it becomes kind of perfunctory. It's hugely biased, right? It's based on whether we like you or not and all kinds of things other than your performance because we're not paying much attention to your performance. Um, and the big risk, of course, for remote workers is if the boss is giving my performance appraisal based on basically what she sees me do, you're a remote worker and they don't see you doing anything, what are they going to say about you, right? That's, a, that's the big downside risk. The plus might be that it could force supervisors to take this whole process more seriously. And by supervisors, I should really say it's not their fault. What we have done in the past is we basically dumped tons of work on supervisors, uh, given them more people to supervise, and we don't really pay much attention to the appraisal process that they do. So, of course, they don't take it very seriously. But if you're going to re manage remote workers well, you have to be much more explicit, much more clear, and you have to communicate more about the actual job. So in the office, I might say, well, I talk to my subordinates every day. Um, yeah, what do you talk about? Well, we talk about the weather and the game last night and, you know, well, we're not talking about, okay, let's talk about the five things that you're working on and how is each of them doing. So surprisingly, there's some evidence that at least many people seem to think that their performance process and relationships with supervisors got better when they were working remotely. Now, if you're really cynical, you might say, well, yeah, uh, I hate my boss. I see her less often and I like this better. 
Um, maybe that's what's going on. But I think the less cynical view is the supervisors in many companies were required to talk to their remote workers several times each week, let's say, check in, and you have to say, what are you working on? How's it going? Here are the five things. Okay, we're going to talk again on Friday. Let's see how this goes, right? Being much more systematic about it. So it could push us in the direction of taking performance management more seriously. Uh, but it, but it might, it, but it might not. You know, it all depends on whether the employers are going to take this seriously. They kind of have to if they want people to be remote, and that would actually be a good thing. Right. So uh, my last question, um, and I'm going to ask you to be uh, to predict what's going to happen. So you say the COVID-19 pandemic is is an event of a lifetime, and um, certainly it's global and um, it's. It, and home span um, an impact has been great uh, but well I'm not sure if it's over uh, but also could you tell us what you think is going to happen in the next two years and how uh, what uh, US and world's employers should be looking at and employees should be looking at um, to better their their positions you know the US is always idiosyncratic on these things particularly compared to Europe uh, and the reason is Power difference is much greater here. That is, employees as a group don't have much political power, uh, and the employers, as a result, are are not spending a lot of time thinking about, you know, what can we do to make our employees, you know, lives easier or better. Uh, and not to say that, say in Europe, they're necessarily thinking about that, but the government's kind of make them do it. Um, so here, I think the most interesting thing that I've seen there was a Slack survey or a survey sponsored by Slack a little while ago, one of the most interesting things I've seen, where they surveyed the sort of business leaders and they surveyed the employees. And what they found among the business leaders is they overwhelmingly thought it was important for people to come back to the office. Um, and then they also asked them about consulting their employees on policies and practices and stuff. And they weren't basically, right? So you got this group of executives, assuming this is true, who really think it's important to come back to the office, and they're not really paying much attention to their employees. So my sense is of what's going on now in the U.S. is that we are drifting back toward the office already, and this has been going on for quite some time. There are some employers who've, who've made big statements about remote work. Most of them have talked about hybrid in the sense of, um, you know, the ability to be flexible about working from home more. But, but not very much has been put in concrete policy language. People are coming back slowly, but more and more back. And at the moment, the Census Bureau data it suggests only about 11% of people are working remotely. Uh, these days. So uh, I think we're drifting back in the direction where we were before of um, people going back to the office under roughly similar circumstances to what they had before. I think one thing that's different is that there will be more variety across employers uh, that you will see some that really have serious hybrid arrangements and others that don't. The big uncertainty is, you know, most employers are still looking to see what everybody else is going to do uh, and whether they're going to have to adopt this in order to be competitive in the labor market. Right now, the labor market's pretty tight. I don't know to what extent that's going to continue. Um, and that will drive whether this expands or not, because I don't think the employers really see how hybrid models are going to help them. Uh, and... Um, the only reason they would do it is if they had to, and that would be competition. It's not clear they're going to have to. That's my guess. Very interesting. Thank you very much, Professor Capelli, for talking to me today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you to all our listeners. This is the New Books Network. My name is Paula de la Cruz Fernandez, and I have been your host for this episode. I'm also an editor and a host of the New Books Network in Español, which I encourage you to check out.